Good afternoon to everyone present in this hearing. This hearing is within the framework of the 179th period of session. It, the goal is to deal with uh, case 13004 about Campamento Massacre against Colombia. I want to start this hearing by greeting everyone present. I am uh, Antonio Rejola, president of the commission and Rapporteur of Colombia. I'm joined by former President and Rapporteur on the Human Rights Defender, Joel Hernandez, by Commissioner Spinala Mena, Commissioner Margaret May, my colleague. And in, we also have the Executive Secretary for uh, Petitions and Cases and the staff of the Executive Secretary that make this hearing possible. I want to thank all of them. And after many hearings, I also want to thank all the interpreters that make this uh, possible and the participation of everyone possible. The goal of this hearing, as I said, is to deal with this case, which is case 13004. I will ask all participants to please keep your microphones off while you are not speaking and your cameras on. We have the interpretation service. If you want to choose uh, to use the services, we also have subtitles if you need to use them. First of all, I want to give the floor to the Secretary for Petitions and Cases, Marisol. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the present case is related to the alleged responsibility of the Colombian state for the participation direct participation of state agents in the violence inflicted in the massacre against the family uh, Lopez due to their militancy in the patriotic union and the lack of due diligence to determine the uh, truth. In the admissibility report, which is 54 slash 15 from October 2015, Commission stated that the participation of uh, agents in the violence inflicted against uh, the family Lopez as a consequence of their militancy in the U and the lack of due diligence to determine um, the responsibilities could be understood as possible violations to Articles 4, Right to Life, 5, Human Treatment, 16. Uh, 17, uh, right to constitute a family, uh, 25, judicial protection in connection to Article 1.1. This hearing was granted by the Commission and is aimed at uh, the parties uh, expressing their merits uh, statements. I will now give you the floor, Madam President. Thank you, Marisol. I will now, we will now hear the presentation from the petitioners who will have 30 minutes. You will be able to see a timer on screen. Please respect this timer. Afterwards, the state will have 30 minutes to make its presentation. The petitioner will be able to make some final remarks and also the state for another five minutes. Afterwards, the commission will be able to ask all pertinent questions and case. And finally, both parties will have five minutes to close this um, hearing. Without further ado, I will give the floor to the petitioners to make their presentation for 30 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone present. I want to greet uh, Madam President Urejola, the Executive Secretariat, and the state representatives present in this hearing. I am Javier Galindo, coordinator of the um, Comisión Colombiana de Juristas. During my participations, I make reference to two topics, the context to which the facts, to the facts and what occurred in June, 1990. Afterwards, my colleague, will make reference to the merits of the case and then we will continue with the victims of the case who
who will be able to speak to the commission. With your permission, I will start by making reference to what the Inter-American Court has expressed um, against the case against Guatemala. It is necessary to mention the context in which the facts occurred in order to understand the reasons why the violations to these human rights occurred or the uh, scope of the violations to of the victims' rights in order to ex explain the situation, I will explain what was going on at that time when the facts occurred. The facts I will make reference to are part of a persecution uh, of the members of the Patriotic Union due to political reasons. The paramilitary uh, groups and armed forces at the beginning of the 90s. The Campamento Massacre includes the participation of multiple state agents with the participation of force, uh, armed forces and paramilitary groups through armed operations, destruction of documents, um, of investigation of the facts in order to keep the impunity of the facts that occurred against members of the UP. This cannot be understood without uh, understanding the context. There was a general context of violation against leaders and members of the UP, as well as paramilitary groups that were promoted by the state that were operating under a national security doctrine. In the case of the militants of the UP in particular, I will tell you the facts that occurred in June 5, uh, 5th, 1990 in the municipality of um, Campamento, La Solita district. That night, someone arrived at the mining company um, and the house occupied by the Lopez family. According to the testimony, a member of the armed forces came to the company, 12 militars uh, went off the vehicle. Once at the uh, house of the Lopez family, they uh, went into the house uh, using gunfire inside the house. At midnight, the Miss Manta Maria woke up they knock on her door saying that the military uh, forces were there. They were asking for food and water. They said that they had water nor food and they were threatened. These persons were threatened. They um, forced the entry. They pointed the gun at her. Francisco Luis Duque was leaving at, um, at that place, Maria Marta Lopez Gaviria was also living then, Mar and also several minors of 12, 8, uh, 7, and 2 months old. Also, there was a person living, uh, sleeping next to the house. All those persons were um, killed except for uh, Darwin and Renzo and Francisco Luis Duque, who managed to flee from the home. It's important to highlight that the bodies of Hildarlo and Hernan Quintero were found with several injuries due to the explosions. There were several holes in the walls due to the um, different gunshots uh, made from outside. One of the children hid under the bed, but at that time Darwin so that Anna was killed uh, due to a gunshot to her head. When one of the men asked, should we kill the boy? He had a negative response by the leader of this operation. Espinosa was, was also killed the uh, body of Marta Maria Lopez Gaviria was also shot and they presented a partial amputation 
of uh, their fingers. Another of the um, bodies was also shot in the head. I was able to highlight just some uh, of the facts, but to conclude, these facts occurred almost 31 years ago. The petition that was presented in 1997 before the commission, so 24 years have elapsed since this petition was requested. That is why we are asking the commission to uh, publish the merits report on this case as soon as possible. I want to thank you for this space. I will now give the floor to my colleague to continue with the merits of the case. Thank you, Commission. I would like to talk about the merits. In the case of the massacre of Campamento, the state is responsible for not complying with its duty to protect. Uh, at the time of the facts, the Department of Antioquia was in a situation of generalized or systematic violence, and this has been proved by the Inter-American system. There were state measures in order to punish paramilitary actions. Uh, those measures did not disactivate the actions of the paramilitary groups and violations of human rights like the massacre of Campamento continue to occur. And the state needed to investigate those facts and those violations. The lack of effectiveness to dismantle the military groups is evidence through the acts of violence in the area, in the region. So the state is responsible for the creation of paramilitary groups and the omission of actions to prevent and to protect civil society, uh, civilians. And the state also did not comply with its duty to respect. There is a letter, an anonymous letter that was sent to the victims, to Marinjuenia, that includes members of the fourth brigade of the army that are mentioned as the responsible for the massacre. And also we have the statement of that win that who survived and who said that the murderers were dressed with military clothes. And also, when a person uh, that came to the place of the facts uh, was uh, uh, interrupted by a woman, a neighbor woman, who said that he should go because he would be killed for being there at the place or the scene of the crimes. We also have judicial investigations in which that said that since 1989, there were uh, complaints against these armed groups because of acts of violence. And the investigations said that the members of those groups were members of the police and of the army. And they also provided support to the uh, illegal groups. Also, uh, there was a statement that talked about the support provided by the national police to the 12 apostles illegal group. And there is investigations that said that the group was uh, made up of police officers as of 1989. And also they wanted to uh, detain Francisco Luque uh, after the massacre. This was also confirmed by Dario Quinones. He talked to the prosecutor of the area to prevent the detention of Francisco because his life was at risk. Residents in the area heard that the responsibles were members of the police and of the army. In the area, there were rumors that the responsibles belonged to state agents or to one of the sections of the army. And after the complaints of the patriotic unit, uh, Campamento was a massacre with the support of the army. And there were some precedents like the massacre of Puerto de Valdivia. And the family Duque Lopez had to move from Valdivia to Campamento because of the threats that they were suffering. And that's why they were, they were massacred. A research, an investigator of the same public prosecutor said that this is part of the dirty work in which police officers and army officers face political uh, entities. 
and the family need to uh, leave uh, Valdivia and move to Campamento because of the threats. In the facts, we believe that there has been participation and involvement of state agents and also police officers and army officers. It has been proved that the intelligence of the army and of the police was involved in the harassing and eliminating those who belong to the left party or left wing party. So we have evidence of the context and taking into consideration the evidence that I have mentioned that has helped to establish that uh, paramilitary groups and the army uh, forces were involved in the massacre because of, and we would like the commission to recognize that the state did not comply with its duties. When the victims are minors, the state needs to be the guarantor and it has a high responsibility based on the best interest of the child. Two victims were minors. They had 12 and seven years old. Their extrajudicial execution by a state agents and the lack of investigation in, are a violation of the rights of the children. Uh, commissioners. The fact that no member of the public forces or the paramilitary groups didn't uh, does not mean that they were not involved in the massacre. It's the opposite. The state considers that even though they have not identified those responsible, they have made the investigation to determine the modus operandi of the investigation. They said that in spite of all the barriers, they have worked with uh, the legions and after 24 years, they have not violated the reasonable period of time for the investigation. They say also, that there were many victims and not a single victim. And that's why the case has been taken so long. According to the protocol of Minnesota for an impartial investigation, it is essential to collect and to preserve physical evidence so that the circumstances of the death are understood. In the first proceedings, the fundamental evidence was collected. This included bullets, etc. Uh, there is no knowledge what happened with that evidence. I, we don't know if those were lost on purpose or not. But in August 2014, it, the uh, state admitted that those elements or that evidence had been destroyed. Second, one of the people who survived, Francisco Luca, was uh, called to uh, provide a statement two days after the massacre in spite of his situation and in spite of the persecution he suffered suffer in, in the past. Then he was called upon to uh, provide a statement 16 years later when he had passed away. So we have other uh, testimonies that were thinking only years after the facts. Regarding the second element, the behavior of the authorities is wrong because they omitted several things. They, the they have locked people. It was an and Taking into consideration the importance of the first years of the investigation, the lack of activity for seven years also caused a lot of problems with the proceeding. This is not the only period of time without activity. We of two years that where no action was taken. And when investigator started to work, the case was sent to another investigator and this did the plan of investigation to not provide information that would help identify the responsible persons they said that the evidence is had, had been destroyed or had burned regarding the uh 
the case, we would like to say that the relatives presented or appeared before the, co uh, the court. Maria Eugenia was accepted as a party to the proceeding. But, and until 2003, the victims did not have an effective participation in the trial or in the pre-trial phase. In addition, during the same process, the victims through their representatives made over 30 requests to the offices. The responses are, the answers are that the information is confidential and that they should go to justice. On September the 1st, 2020, we presented a request for evidence uh, before the prosecutor that was that had the case. In January 2020, we sent an, 2021, we sent another email requesting information. The prosecutor said that since July 2020, the case was reassigned to a new prosecutor office. But for the work carried out by these lawyers or by us, uh, requested a permit to review the proceeding, but we have not received any answer. The state is saying that after 30 years, they have not violated the reasonable period of time, but that is ridiculous. Victims have been submitted to a systematic plan and they have been ignored and their rights have been ignored. Therefore, we would like to declare that the state has violated legal protection of the, those who survived the massacre and the victims and the families of the victims. Uh, the state is responsible also for the violation of the rights to life, integrity, and children's rights. In the case of the massacre of La Rochela, the, the violation of Article 4 was uh, established. In this case, the goal of the paramilitary groups was to eradicate or to eliminate the lives of all those who were opponents. The two people who survived suffered during the attacks injuries on their bodies and they are present. The uncertainty that those who survived had and the fear that they had because they could be deprived of their life with a psychological suffering, the miners were direct witnesses of the attack and they suffered physical and psychological consequences. Darwin saw how his loved ones were murdered and this created a trauma. This suffering was extended for several years because of the lack of actions by on the side of the state. Therefore, we request that the state is responsible for violating the life, the integrity, the children's rights in detriment of those who survived. Regarding the relatives, the court has said that they could be victims and therefore there could be a violation to psychological and moral integrity. The facts in Campamento created a uh, destruction of the families, especially those who lost their children. Many were not able to have a family. Oscar Duques lost her partner, Elvia, and his son, Enzo. Maria Eugenia has said that her sister, Nancy Lopez, disappeared in 1992. Francisco Duque left the area and decided to start a new life. Maria Eugenia Lopez, in spite of the threats, decided to seek for justice and reparation. That's why I would like to declare that the state has been responsible for the violation of the rights to family and to integrity for the relatives of the uh, victims of the massacre of Campamento. So that's why we request the commission to prepare the merits report and to declare the responsibility of the state of Colombia for the violations of the rights to life and integrity and also their violation of the rights of children and the violation of the right to life and personal integrity and children's rights 
also for Darwin Lopez and Renzo Duque, and also the violations of the rights enshrined in Article 5, 8, and 25 of the Convention in the detriment of the, fam of the family members. Also, the right to freedom of the speech of the family members, and we would like the state to deepen the investigations and to provide family members and relatives psychological support and also to prepare a celebration or an, a memory uh, celebration in order to uh, honor those who lost their lives. Now I would like to give the floor to Darwin Lopez who survived uh, that day and to Maria Eugenia. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dardo Cristobal Lopez. Regarding what occurred that night, I'm going to tell you what, what happened. They got there at night, they knocked the door, they asked for food and water. Marta Maria Lopez told them there was they didn't have any. They asked for the men in the house to get outside. She said that they were away. Immediately, they threw something through the window and there was an explosion. She hide the kids behind the curtains and then under the bed. Two men started shooting many times, too many times. We were a defenseless human beings in the house. A piece of roof fell over me and I fell asleep. When they got inside the house, they put a flashlight in my face. One of them dressed in green looked at me and said, we killed him. And the other one said, no, we need a witness. So they took me out. In the backyard, there were several men that had weapons. They put me inside the bathroom. And I was scared, so I left again. One of them questioned me. He asked me questions regarding what was inside the house. The man who was shooting, who was him? Why was he carrying a weapon? They used them to hunt. So I went inside the house trying to find, they were searching for something inside the house. I don't know what, they got out again and they told me, if someone asks who did this, you tell them that the ELN did this, that the National Liberation Army did this. So I heard a boy crying, I went inside the house. I saw the body of Marta Maria Lopez. I don't know why I didn't look at all of them. I went outside with the boy. I put them in the cribble until sunrise. I 
just got the boy and went to my neighbor's house. They thought they had seen a ghost or something. They look at the kid. He was crying. They took me to the kitchen to protect me. And that is what occurred that night. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Maria Eugenia Lopez. daughter of Marta Maria Lopez as families we have always been militants of the UP when threats started coming they threw leaflets leaflets with the name of my stepfather the name of my mother and the name of several relatives and many other persons those who are threats telling us they gave us two days to leave the village from Inca La Esperanza. We left. I went to Medellin and my mother went to Campamento. She was pregnant with Renzo and she was worried. So when Renzo was born, My mom called me from the health center and said from six, five to six, they were going to live to a finca. We were going to be okay there. We were going to have cattle. We were able to work to the livelihood of the family in that place we were going to feel protected we were going to be united as a family I'm sorry Amidst the happiness um, we were going through, we were talking about finding a school. My mother was very happy because we were going to be reunited as a family. She, on June the 2nd, the massacre occurred. This is terrible for us as a family. And on June the 8th, I always bought the El Colombiano newspaper and I saw the article that some are, people had been arrested in Antioquia. When I got there, Um, wounded soldier was being carried I wasn't allowed to go inside because they were providing medical attention to that member of the army afterwards 
I kept on working on the case, filing the complaints. I was threatened. I, I gave my testimony and afterwards an anonymous letter was sent to me saying that all persons that have participated were threatened. I have always reported this because as a family, we need the state to investigate, to give an answer about the truth who were the persons who participated in the attack in although i have insisted a lot with my complaints case is part of the pre trial is it pre trial stage there hasn't been an investigation The Colombian state has not investigated in this case. In that sense, there is a lack of investigation. We have not had as we have, I didn't have any support from this Colombian state. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to ask the petitioners, uh, you have used one extra minute. I would like to know if you have concluded. Yes, we have concluded, Madam President. Thank you. Thank you. Then I would like to give the floor to the state. The, you will have 31 minutes to present. Uh, you will have 15 minutes and then you it will restart. Uh, if you're paying attention to the timer, you will see that it's up to 15 minutes and then 15 minutes more. Uh, you will have 31 minutes for your presentation. Honorable commissioners and petitioners, my name is Susana Arango and together with my colleague Leonardo Romero, we are part of the delegation of the Colombian state for this hearing. The state of Colombia is aware of the seriousness of the facts that occur in La Solita district in the municipality of Campamento in Antioquia on June the 5th of 1990. The violent death of Maria Marta Gopez Aria, Ana Jolie Gopez Lumes, Marta Magdalena Gopez, Elvia Rosa Velasquez Espinosa, Luis Girardo Lopez Gavilia, Hernan Quintero, and the suffering caused to Francisco Luis Dupeque Pino and the minors Darwin Cristobal Lopez Giveria and Reyes Antonio Duque are uh, very sad things that should not have happened. In order to understand this case, it's necessary to evaluate the context of the armed conflict in Colombia at the time of the facts and at the place of the facts. Also, it is necessary to mention the different tools that the state of Colombia used in order to identify those responsible and to repair uh, the victims. In the next presentation, the state will cover the following parts. First, the criminal investigation that has been opened and the mechanisms adopted for, uh, by the state to combat armed groups. Second, the mechanisms of transitional justice. And third, the relationship between the facts and the UP and also the massacre of Campamento with the case of UP. And also we would like to propose a dialogue uh, to the petitioners. I would talk about the first two things. The state regrets deeply the fact that occurred in Campamento in June 1990, where six people died violently and three were injured. These facts occur in a context of violence in the country, where there were different actors that affected in a serious way civilians. 
Amongst those that were most affected by violent acts are human rights defenders, leaders, members, and militants of the Patriotic Union. The state of Colombia accepts that in the Department of Antioquia, at the time of the facts, there was a situation of critical violence because of the actions of illegal armed groups. The state agrees with the petitioners that these violence acts are regrettable and are one of the most painful facts in the history of Colombia. As I will present later, the state uh, took measures in order to anticipate the criminal proceeding and due to the wave of violence in the country to combat violence, uh, organized violence in the country. Due to the complexity of the criminal case and the, multi the multiple actors that were involved and the difficulties to carry out uh, proceedings or to carry out uh, or to prepare actions in the middle of the conflict, the, that affect the possibility of authorities to act in a diligent way. Regarding the criminal investigation, it's important to mention that the National uh, or Attorney General Office needs to investigate uh, the case and also is a public service and it's a way to protect the constitutional law and the constitutional right to access to justice. It's important also to mention the definition of the American Court of Human Rights used for the case Paniagua Morales against Guatemala. Impunity is the failure to persecute, to capture, to trial, and to sanction those responsible of the violations of the rights enshrined in the American Convention on Human Rights. Taking into consideration the American standards, it could be said that the Office of the Public Prosecutor has carried out the investigation in order to collect relevant evidence in order to promote the proceeding. This shows the commitment of the state to complete with the obligations of the case. In 1990, uh, we started the investigation and now the section of the human rights of the National Public Prosecutor Office is promoting the investigation. The uh, several investigations, the victims were militants of left-wing parties and we have the same way of operating by armed groups at the time of the facts. Uh, the hypothesis of the investigation was that the facts were committed by the 12 apostles and other armed groups. Also, the responsibility of some state agents was considered in the investigation. In order to study both scenarios, several proceedings have been carried out in the file, there are several proceedings that included 70 statements, requests, eight re, uh, in, uh, inspections to uh, police stations and army stations. Also, we have had inspections to the hospital. We, uh, nine resolutions for evidence uh, have been admitted. And also some proceedings or some uh, actions to uh, obtain interviews and service. But this goes beyond criminal investigation. The actions of the state include also preventive measures in order to dismantle disarmed groups, armed groups, and to prevent them from committing other crimes. We cannot ignore the reality. The state is aware that there are some bodies of the system that have made pronouncements regarding the responsibility of the state of Colombia for uh, not issuing some measures to dismantle these groups. But at the same time, the state of Colombia made efforts to combat these groups. And also those measures were recognized in some of the decisions of, decisions of the Inter-American Court. The Inter-American Court highlighted the legislative measures that were taken to counteract the crimes committed by these self-defense groups. Also, the uh, regulation 180 of 2008 also typify the crimes and also uh, talked about the entry of persons to these paramilitary groups. 
The court has recognized the efforts of the state, but the commission did the same in its annual reports of from 1998, 2004, 2005, and 2006. In those reports, the combat, the dismantling of self-defense groups and other illegal groups operating in Colombia was recognized. And the efforts made by the state of Colombia was also recognized when it comes to the combat and to dismantling armed groups in Colombia. The state has implemented measures to control the actions of illegal groups illegal groups, and it has shown its commitment to human rights and to the victims of the conflict in order to identify the acts of violence. And it has included in its legal system resolutions that prohibited the creation of these illegal groups. It has established special mechanisms in order to investigate and sanction the behaviors and the actions committed by these groups. And it has implemented a regulation system of transitional justice in order to promote the dismantling of these groups and to facilitate the, reinsertion, the reinsertion of their members into the civil uh, life and to give in comprehensive reparations for the victims. Uh, part of the success of the state has to do with implementation of legal measures uh, through dialogue processes with armed groups. Colombia is a pioneer uh, we, uh, regarding transitional justice systems. And it has included in its legislation and standards to prevent violations of human rights in order to identify criminal structures. The model of transitional justice in Colombia is one of the most comprehensive ones in the world. They try to seek for the judgment of those responsible of atrocious crimes by uh, preserving the right to reparation and non-repetition. Through law 975 of 1995, the model of transitional justice called justice and peace began. And this includes the reintegration process of these armed groups. The uh, justice courts of Bogota, Barranquilla and Medellin, which include 10 justices, five of them work for the control of the protection, they have issued over uh, 700 judgments. And thanks to these judgments, we have been able to identify the structures, the patterns of crimes of these groups, and also the violations that were committed by these groups. We also reported over 71,000 victims and reparations went over $800 billion. And the illegal groups have surrendered and delivered their arms as of 2001. After a legislative legislation of 2017, the transitional justice model was included in this legislation and is one of the justice components of the uh, peace agreement, which was signed between the national government and the FARC in November 2016. During the first uh, years uh, of this unit, there have been seven macro cases that cover 9,700 victims, over 800 mem state members are also involved and other members of other state agents and other uh, people who have voluntarily presented before the courts. Those cases include 320,000 victims that participated in an active way in the different stages of those criminal proceedings. These models of justice uh, live or stay in Colombia together with traditional justice models. The state would like to say that the model of the transitional justice is compatible or consistent with the Inter-American Convention. The Uh, I, there is a problem with the audio. 
So the model is based on the principles of international law, for example, restorative justice, the centrality of the victims, the prohibition of amnesty when there are serious violations of human rights and the serious violations of international humanitarian law. These models are correct to address violations such as this one or this case. The state wants to mention that this could be related to the victims of the UP to date, the uh, transitional um, justice bodies have been analyzing the facts to determine the context of the, the victimization of the members of the UP looking for the disappeared and the responsible ones. The HEP has opened the 06 macro case regarding victimization of members of the UP and 04 regarding the territorial situation that is related to the UP as well. Within this context, as some of the victims are related uh, as alleged victims of the UP, we understand that the facts of the massacre the Campamento Massacre have to do with the topic investigated by the macro cases of this special unit. This jurisdiction may be competent to know about these facts. The fact that uh, there are two macro cases analyzing the topics related to the UP has um, important legal effects in connection to the principle as the Inter-American Court has pointed out, makes it impossible for a case to be known uh, for the bodies of the system without the state solving the internal situation first. An in interpretation of this principle with effects on the merits of the case would allow the Commission to value the uh, progress made by the state in connection to these facts and that they provide the state the uh, guarantee of the mechanisms and allow national judges to determine the scope and the responsibility and the codification of the crimes. The openness, the op opening to macro cases shows the will of the state to investigate in a comprehensive way these facts. The Colombian state has the Trust that the Commission will value in this case a decision that would submit to the uh, transitional justice mechanisms to allow officials working in, in, within the system. The Colombian state wants to highlight that this requires a special analysis that has to do with case 1000. Uh, regarding the um, political members of the UP that is now being judged uh, before the International Court. Said case of the UP, in that case, the Commission provided a list of the alleged victims in its merit report without analyzing the specific facts. Also, the visibility within the American system, certain victims and certain petitions and cases before the Commission are being um, presented following the same line as the case of the UP. That is the context of the Campamento massacre. Regarding the facts that caused the death, the death of Marta Maria Lopez Gaviria, Luis Gilda Lopez Gaviria, Silvia Rosa Velázquez Espinosa are uh, alleged victims uh, that in the case that was presented before the Inter-American Court. Colombia requested the court to establish the scope, to limit the scope of the UP to those facts that are carefully analyzed by the commission in its merit report and requested the exclusion of all the other cases submitted by the Commission and other proceedings that are being questioned within the framework of our requests, other requests. 
In that line, the state requests the commission to adopt necessary measures before a meeting issuing a merits report to guarantee that the state is not being tried twice for the same crime and is not um, obliged to pay twice for the same crime. It also requires the commission to establish what are the best guidelines uh, or the best path for the state to follow to guarantee the rights of the victims. It is necessary to uh, say that since 2016, the petitioners express the um, willingness to start a friendly solution settlement. However, regarding the scope of the UP case, Colombia did not uh, start the, the, that uh, agreement, although it considered it timely. The victims, in spite of, of the fact that they're not part of the case uh, presented before the court, they will be certain uh, sentences from the court that will impact this international request that may imply giving away certain specific reparation measures in the instant case. In spite of this context, the state wants to open dialogue with the petitioners in order to uh, carry out a friendly settlement agreement. The Colombian state really states that they regret what has occurred in Campamento Municipality. The state understands the suffering of the relatives and expresses its solidarity. We cannot forget Marta Maria Lopez Gaviria, Elvia Lopez, Hernán Quintero, Elvia Rosa Blasquez Espinosa, Luis Gilardo Lopez Gaviria, and Ana Duques Lopez. The state believes it is following the right, right path in order to avoid the repetition of the facts. And it manifests its commitment to investigate what has occurred. The state is aware of the request of the victims, taking into account the context of the UP case and the Eastern case, the Colombian state expresses its willingness to analyze the facts within a friendly settlement agreement context. That's why we are available to the victims in order to reach an agreement. The state is aware of the seriousness of the facts that have to do with the UP members in which the state has already expressed it recognizes the responsibility in certain circumstances. That's why and we, because we want to honor uh, international commitments and duties, Colombia wants this case to be solved through a friendly settlement. The state wants to clarify before the commission that the statement made does not imply the acceptance of, a, of the fact that the willingness to start a dialogue to reach an agreement that uh, provides reparation for them. Within the framework of the Friendly Settlement Agreement, the state will analyze with the victims its responsibility regarding the facts. Coherence in public service and rigorosity in regarding what occurred in the past are fundamental elements for a country to move forward towards the future. The Colombian state will not stop looking for justice and truth in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Does the state want to add anything else? No, Madam Commissioner. Thank you. So I will now give the floor to the petitioners. I think you have seven minutes. Is that correct, Marisol? Yes. Thank you, Madam President. First of all, we would like to make some comments, first of all, with the last two points presented by Leonardo. And afterwards, my colleague will speak regarding what 
uh, Susanna has mentioned. In that sense, first of all, regarding the notification made by the Commission on August 2020, the only person that was in the case was Luis Edgardo López Gaviria. The other victims mentioned by the agent are not included in the um, case of uh, members of the UP. That is a point I want to clarify. Secondly, as our colleagues have told us, in the instant case, the case that is being uh, presented before the court, the victims, um, Gildardo, Elvia Rosa, Marta Maria, and Quintero, There's an objection if they are excluded in the case before the uh, court. Having said that, we want to thank the proposal of the state regarding a friendly settlement agreement, but we believe that after 31 years, it is quite late to reach a friendly settlement agreement. The victims at that time they have expressed in this hearing what they have lived during these years. We have talked to them. They agree. They do not want a friendly settlement agreement, taking into account that the case was presented in 1997, before the year 2000. Um, we want the commission to issue a merits report as soon as possible, taking into account Article 50 of the American Convention, taking into account the international responsibility of the Colombian state. I will now give the floor to my colleague um, so he can reply the uh, comments of the state. Thank you. Regarding what has been said by the representatives of the states, especially by Susana Arango, she presented uh, the facts and the measures that were taken in order to uh, prohibit and to dismantle paramilitary groups. Uh, the goal of this hearing is not to talk about the measures or not to recognize those measures. It has been proved by the court after the case, uh, the massacre Lituango and other cases that were presented before the court that the measures taken by the state did not dismantle the paramilitary groups. That is an objective risk. Those measures were not enough and the violations of human rights continued in the region of Antioquia, uh, and where there was a lot of violence there. Uh, by 1990, when the massacre of Campamento occurred, even though there was a decree to punish paramilitary actions in the area, there were huge violations of human rights. For example, the massacre of Puerto Valdivia of April 1990, that was uh, carried out by the fourth brigade of the army and in the state where the massacre was conducted, the Luque family was living there. So because of the threats in Valdivia, they were forced to displace to Campamento and the criminal groups went to Campamento and they were followed and persecuted because of their militancy in the UP. And therefore the measures of the state did not dismantle the risk. And it has been already determined by the court and by the commission, the state should uh, provide a response for these actions. And also we we recognize all the measures of transitional justice. But regarding those transitional justice measures, none of those measures have an impact on this case. 
the victims were not offered a measure to guarantee their reparation or the minors were not offered a psychological treatment. Up to now, uh, the victims have not been heard because of the facts and the suffering that they have undergone after 30 years of impunity. So we thank the commission for hearing us. As we uh, mentioned in our merits allegations, especially today, that is the international date uh, of truth regarding the dignity of the victims. The right to truth is a right that has been mentioned in several instruments as an autonomous right. It's important for the reparation of the victims and also for the community in order to prevent the repetition of these facts as the massacre of Campamento. After almost 31 years of criminal investigations, the case is still in a pretrial phase. The relatives have not been guaranteed their right to know what actually happened. And the civil and military actions have prevented knowing the truth. And this has affected the rights of the victims of those who survive and the relatives. That's why we request the commission to state the violation of the rights under the convention and to present a merits report for the case. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to give the floor now to the state for seven minutes so they can reply. Thank you, Commissioner. The state regrets deeply the words uh, expressed by the petitioners. It repeats a willingness to uh, solve this case through a friendly settlement agreement. We would like to mention another point. The facts are connected to the list that the commission presented in the, for the case of the patriotic union. Those cases and those victims uh, were uh, questioned by the representatives of the states. And Luis Gaviria, Marta Lopez Garibia, and Nan Quintero and Maria Rosa Velasquez are in the lists that were presented for the case of the patriotic union in a merits report that the commission could adopt the measures should be taken in order to avoid the duplicity of the proceedings so that this does not affect the guarantees and the rights of the state. So the cases of these people should be uh, removed or should be excluded of the international proceeding. That's it? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you uh, to representatives of the states. Thank you to the petitioners. Thank you to the state for all the information provided. First, I would like to greet Maria Eugenia and Darwin. We would like to thank you for your testimonies uh, today. It's always important to listen and to hear, hear the victims first. And I would like to thank you for appearing today to the, in this hearing. I first would like to make some general comments. I think I would like to talk about the topic that is key in this discussion. I would like to support or to repeat the support uh, of the commission to the GEP. We have supported their work many times. Uh, the situation of the macro cases uh, mentioned by the state is something that we need to see if it's okay or not according to the principles and other background information, but we will write down that information. And regarding the applicity with the case 11,027, 
that has been analyzed by the court, I would like to mention the case of Pueblo Samaraga, Saramaca against Suriman. In order for the publicity to be there, there are three elements, that the parties are the same, that the object is the same, and that the legal basis is identical. And therefore, if the three aspects are not complied with, there will be no duplicity. There will be duplicity if the arguments of the petitioners are the same, uh, because in the case of the UP, is under analysis before the court. It has not been solved. And therefore, the discussion of this hearing uh, is OK. Uh, notwithstanding, the commission will make a decision after the allegation presented by the state taking into consideration all this background information and all the background information that we have for the case uh, 11,027 of the UP. I have some questions for the petitioners, especially regarding the publicity. And I would like to ask the petitioners if they can provide more information regarding differences between the facts and the legal basis between the two cases, this case and the case 11127, by taking into consideration the case law of the court in this matter. That is my question. I would like to give the floor now to Commissioner Joel Hernandez. I don't know if he has any comments to make. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to make one comment. I would like to suggest the state that in his written communication, in their written communications, it would be good if they can uh, tell us how the investigation was conducted and if there has been a systematic plan of investigation that would explain why the investigation was carried out within a reasonable period of time. Commissioner Esmeralda, you have the floor now. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to greet the petitioners, especially I would like to show my solidarity with Maria Eugenia and Darwin for your trust, for sharing with us your testimonies, your statements. And I would like to thank the representatives of the states for all the information that you have provided. I have a question for the state. Taking into consideration what Maria Eugenia was saying, the possibilities of they as victims or as relatives of the victims. Uh, we would like to know uh, that they wanted to be in the proceeding. They wanted to have access to the information. They wanted to access the documentation that is relevant to the case. So we would like to know uh, the involvement of the victims or the relatives of the victims in the proceeding. I am concerned about the arguments regarding the publicity. Uh, the commissioner Rejol already mentioned the arguments. We need to listen to the uh, arguments or the allegations uh, I think it's important to listen to uh, see what are the, di the differences are between the two cases. We need to identify those differences. Uh, regarding the involvement of the victims, I have another question for the state. Have you summoned the victims so they receive any type of reparation? Are they being considered as victims? in order to start with the reparation process that is still pending. Have you tried to reach them? Have you ever talked to the victims regarding reparations? I would like to know the communication that you have had with the victims in terms of reparations because the state acknowledges that these were serious violations of human rights. So I would like to know uh, that relationship. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Rosamena. I would like to give the floor to Commissioner Margaret May McCall. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam President. 
I first want to um, greet Maria, Eugenia, and Darwin, and to express my sympathy for what happened to your family members so many years ago. And um, I also greet civil society and thank them for um, what they're doing in this regard. I also greet the representatives of the state and thank them for their submissions to us this afternoon. Um, I do have some questions on a comment, first of all, that the state said that they sympathize and understood the position of the victims in this matter. And yet we're here 31 years later with no resolution at all in such an egregious, egregious loss when a young a mother, a recent mother was killed and her two month old baby seemed to have survived the massacre by fate and eight-year-old Darwin as well. And we haven't heard of any emotional, psychological reparation, rehabilitation, um, health assistance given to them by the state. At least uh, I, I haven't heard it. And it grieves me, it hurts one human rights sensibilities. I have certain questions for the state, mainly two. Um, because you agree that the acts were, and the word used was regrettable, but it was worse than that. It was egregious, egregious human rights violations. Anyway, what exactly, my first question, what exactly has the state done about the destruction of items of possible evidence by state agencies during the investigation of this matter? And was, I go further, developing that question, was any legal or administrative action taken against any of those who were responsible for the custody, that is the safekeeping of the records and items collected at the scene of the massacre. For example, the cartridges of the bullets used, which could have led to the identity of the weapons used and therefore of the identity of the perpetrator. So was anything done to those persons who were responsible for the safety of those items, vital bits of evidence, and seemingly lost them or destroyed them without any authority from what I've seen from the papers? And if not, to the state explain why not? Because that is what, in my view, as a defense lawyer for over 40 years, damaged the, the, the investigation completely and therefore spoiled the case. And my final question is also, could you please explain why um, Maria, Eugenia and family who were trying to pursue the investigation of this matter were not permitted to be involved or to receive information for 12 years of this so-called investigation. I think I will end there. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I will now give the floor to Marisol Blanchard. I have a question, Madam President. I don't know if they understood what the Commissioner 
has said. There is interpretation. I explained that at the beginning. I don't know if they turn on the icon, but there is simultaneous interpretation. I don't know if they used it, but good afternoon. I'm sorry, we didn't. Unfortunately, I'm sorry for you, but afterwards, this hearing is being recorded and you will be able to access it in YouTube and Facebook and you will be able to listen to the interpretation of what Margaret has said. I'm sorry you were not able to listen now. You have to continue with the hearing. I will now give the floor to the Secretary of Petition and Cases, Marisa Blanchard. Thank you, Madam President. A question to the state. I wanted to know what kind of reparation measures have you provi provided to the survivors of the massacres and the relatives of the alleged victims? Thank you. Thank you, Marisol. So I will now give the floor to the petitioners and to the state. You have five minutes. I know that certain topics cannot be answered right now, but it's really important that all the information that you have provided orally in your presentations, and now you should forward it in written within a month. So if you're not able to answer now, please send that information by email. You have five minutes. I give the floor to the petitioners. Thank you, Madam President. I want to thank you for all the questions that were asked. We're going to focus on two that are really important. First of all, that was restated by several commissioners in connection to reparation in them, uh, any kind of reparation or any action carried out by the state, any compensation to provide to, to the victims has sent exit exist, it did not exist. There hasn't been any psychological aid with any restitution of rights, nothing for the minors that were present and were witness of the massacre, nor to any of, of the relatives or the person that was able to escape from the massacre. They did not receive a compensation. There hasn't been a plan from the state to provide reparation in the last 31 years and in connection to the UP, I think that it's quite clear that the UP case that is uh, discussed at the court right now, this uh, is preventing uh, the state to investigate what occurred in the Campamento massacre as the object is completely different. We are talking about the massacre of a family, a boy that had to see how the relatives were shot to death. That is not being analyzed or reviewed by the court in the case of the UP. Although it is true, that Hildarlo was part of the UP and regarding to what the commission has said, well, we understand that the there is uh, information that is shared there, but that the object is not the same and the facts are not the same. Victims are completely different. We are talking about Darwin, Maria Eugenia, all the persons we have already mentioned in our initial presentation. The merits report regarding the UP issued by the commission, none of these victims are mentioned. This case cannot, is not being um, discussed by the Inter-American system. In the last minutes, I would like to give the floor to Maria Eugenia or Darwin if they want to add information or make any comments in this hearing. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Well.
everything has been said regarding the case. Darwin never received psychological treatment regarding the reparation, we have not received any reparation, but as relatives, we would like a reparation to exist. First of all, the best reparation as family is for the state to provide an answer regarding the investigation. We need a pecuniary reparation as well. Where we were displaced, we left our state behind, everything behind. As displaced family, it's been really hard, really painful. And the truth is that we want the Colombian state to provide an answer to us as relatives of the victims. Thank you. Thank you. You have 15 seconds in case Darwin wants to say something, but please be brief. Good afternoon. Again, I want to thank you for listening to us, for devoting your time to the case. God bless you and thank you. Thanks to you. I'm sorry. I want to thank you too for listening to us, understanding us. This is really hard. And God bless you and protect you all. Thank you. Thank you. I will now give the floor to the state for seven minutes. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. The state will uh, express all the answers in written uh, regarding the questions posed by the commissioners. Thank you to the representatives of the state. We conclude now this hearing, case 1304. Thanks. Thank you for the information you have presented the lawyers of the victims on behalf of my colleagues we appreciate the testimonies of Maria Eugenia and Darwin. And although you do not have a reparation yet, it's important for you to tell in your own words what has happened. Thank you to the estate for the willingness in this case. We are waiting for you to send all the information in written all the information that you consider to be necessary, please do it within a month starting today. Please send it to the Secretariat of Petitions and Cases. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon. Goodbye.